I've long expressed an interest in doing a video or some videos on Irish English. Um, and this is something I haven't really known about very much beyond a few loose things like um, conservative features like not having a fur fern merger, so pronouncing for and fern with two different vowels. I won't have done it perfectly there, but you know what I mean. Um, so, given that I, I feel like I know enough about phonetics and historical linguistics to approach this from that angle, um, but without claiming that I already know very much about Irish English, I'm going to explore it in this video and hopefully it will be as much of a learning experience for me as it is for anybody watching. Um, if you are Irish or you're a speaker of Irish English, I hope that this, um, this video will both shed maybe a new light on your own uh, dialect of English, at least the pronunciation of your own dialect of English, and also allow you to teach me some things about it if you think that I've made a mistake or if you want to add more detail in a comment or something like that. I'd be very happy to read any corrections or any additions that you might have. I don't mean to imply, of course, uh, at any point in this video that Northern Ireland and the Republic of Ireland are in any way the same country. Um, I, I'm treating it as a dialect continuum because I feel that there are, as far as I know, features in common between Northern Irish English and Republic of Ireland English. So for the purposes of this video, I'll treat it as a continuum. Um, and because I can't, in one video, do justice to the enormous variety in Irish English pronunciation, I'm going to vaguely base my interpretation around six, uh, six points. Update from the editing room. Uh, I realised that it was a ridiculous... Uh, hope I'm not covering the microphone. I realised it was a ridiculous uh, idea to try and do six locales across Ireland in one video. Um, so I'm just going to be focusing on the vowel systems of Belfast and Derry, the two Northern Irish uh, places in this video, and I'll do the others in later videos, sorry about that, although um, it will it'll be clear in the title hopefully what I'm doing. Um, again, if people feel like these were not the best points to, to, to capture the wide diversity that, that exists, let me know what I, you know what I could have done better. So, as it stands, I think I can broadly uh, recognise a Northern Irish accent from a Republic of Irish, uh, a Republic of Ireland one. Um, and I use various features to do this which I'm conscious of and probably some which I'm not conscious of. So one of the ones I use is the existence of a what seems to be a centering diphthong in certain words that would have the face vowel in my own accent. So a diphthong something like ear or ear. Um, whereas I think the Republic of Ireland accents tend more towards having a monophthong like ear in these words. Um, another one is having uh, in, in diphthongs which end in my accent with a high back off glide, um, having a fairly fronted but still rounded off glide. So, for example, pronouncing you as something like ye, or pronouncing cow as something like kai. Um, those, those are two major differences, uh, or two major features of Northern Irish English uh, that I recognise already just from listening to recordings and things. Another note from the editing studio, um, I thought, for, for my speakers, I thought who is somebody who's definitely from Belfast and of whom there are lots of recordings and who has a relatively conservative accent. And I thought Jerry Adams is someone of whom there are a lot of recordings. And it was only a little way into making uh, the video that my dad pointed out to me that Jerry Adams' voice could not legally be broadcast on English television between 1988 and 1994, so they had to overdub him with a different Irish bloke's voice. Um, I believe this clip is from 1996, and his voice sounds like Jerry Adams, and his, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think it is him. Big, <laughs> big mistake if it's not, but you know, I, I'm pretty sure it is. The British government had not defeated the IRA when the IRA leadership declared the cessation 18 months ago. This obviously won't be all of the vowels in his accent, um, but what I'm trying to do here is be careful not to use the categories from my own accent to influence how I think about this too much. We can see that there's a short central vowel that appears in the words British, government and 
uh, leadership. Redman, the um, in my accent, this would this would be two separate vowel phonemes. I have a uh, in government and i in British and leadership. Um, is it possible that these emerged as a central quality in Jerry Adams's accent? Well, we'll explore that in a little bit. There seems to be a longer version of this uh vowel in declare blur, blur, blur. that may or may not be related to the central vowel in words like British. There is an e vowel fairly similar to my own in defeated and leadership. Uh, the only difference from mine is that it's kind of a, a broader diphthong. There's more difference between the tongue position of the start and the end. A, A, laid. Repeat, repeat. There is a raising diphthong in the word, a goal. There are low back, relatively unrounded vowels in words like government, Gov a, had, Pardon. a, and a rounded one in month, something like a. Month. Whether the vowel in government and the vowel in month are the same phoneme, I don't know. Historically, I would expect them to be, but it does seem like they're pronounced quite differently in this recording. But then when people are speaking quickly, they do often have uh, wide allophonic ranges for their vowels, which means that they, they pronounce them in a, a variety of ways. You also have this, um, this centering diphthong, which I mentioned, and he has a, a sort of high starting point for this centering diphthong, or relatively high. So in cessation and eight, he has something like ear. In not, he has a vowel which could be the same vowel as in had, but I would say its quality is slightly more fronted. Ah. Not. He seems to have a robust price vowel. I. I. And interestingly, in the last syllable of the word defeated, he has a fairly fronted quality, almost as if he's saying defeated. Defeated. Although whether that is actually his dress vowel as well is yet to be seen. I've run through the rest of the recording and I've come up with a way of kind of ramming these vowels into something approximating my own vowel system with my own lexical sets. And obviously this isn't appropriate for his accent, um, but I think this is one way of maybe um, working out the differences is by trying to look, it, look at it through the lens of my own accent and seeing where that doesn't fit. So I've highlighted a few um, cases where his accent very clearly differs from mine. And the first one I'll look at is the face vowel, where I would just have one vowel, um, A. In Jerry Adams's accent, it seems like there are at least two variants. One that's uh, something like a centering diphthong, like ear, and one that's very much more similar to my face vowel, A or A. Now, let's look at the situations in which he uses these vowels throughout the recording. The IRA Association, 18 months, two ways to engage what the IRA leadership were persuaded to. They, the John Major, and let me say, to face in high places in some way. At first, my instinct was that these might actually be two separate phonemes, a phonemic distinction that's preserved from very early modern English, where they had a different vowel from face. But now, actually looking at the two lists of words where these different vowels occur, it makes more sense to me that it's actually um, a, an allophonic thing. In other words, a speaker probably processes these two types of sound as the same kind of vowel categorically, but which one they use depends on the environment that it's in. If it's at the start of a morpheme or inside a morpheme, a morpheme being a sort of meaningful building block that makes up part of a word, then you get this ear pronunciation. Whereas if it's at the end of a morpheme, you get this A pronunciation. There's only one example that I can find where uh, this vowel is found at the end of a morpheme, but inside of a word, in the word ways. Because here you have, you know, a word made up of two morphemes, way and the plural marker, s. And in this case, you have air, wares. Wares, wares, wares. So I think that this is a complicated allophonic situation where if it's inside of a morpheme or at the start, it's ear, and if it's at the end of a morpheme, it's a, and if it's at the end of a morpheme but inside of a word, it's air. That's my hypothesis based on this relatively limited set of words. Listening to more words might uh, change what I think about this, and that might change later in the video because I'm making this uh, as I, you know, this is, this is being edited as I make it, so I may 
I may actually come to a different conclusion later in the video. The British government leadership declared the cessation. One is for Irish Republicans from this platform. Looking at this now, I think I may have um, not transcribed these vowels very well uh, the first time I watched the video because I was just doing a kind of on-the-fly one. Um, and I might not even have transcribed them fantastically here because I'm just doing it by ear and I'm not fantastic at deciding whether something should have a completely central uh, IPA character or a sort of central peripheral IPA character. But having listened to these kind of frame by frame now and probably having a slightly better idea of their actual qualities, I would say that there's a clearer pattern of more central peripheral qualities tending to be used in stressed syllables and central qualities uh, being used in unstressed syllables. And this is pretty similar to my pattern where I have a central vowel, uh, which is, is used in unstressed syllables, and a, a peripheral or a more peripheral vowel, i, which is used in both stressed and unstressed syllables. My accent is probably in a minority among English accents in having uh, a distinction between i and uh in unstressed syllables. So for me, the words chicken and thicken don't rhyme like they do in most accents of English. I don't know whether chicken and thicken would rhyme in Jerry, Jerry Adams' accent, in other words, whether he has the weak vowel merger. Um, I think this kind of thing would probably take a lot more um, examples and probably a native speaker to ask questions to. So I may have to consult the literature on this later, and I will, at the end of this video, probably um, have, a, have a look through the literature and see how much I've got right. But yeah, I would suggest that he probably does have a separate kit phoneme, even though its realisation may be laxer or more central in a lot of cases than it is in my dialect. Government 18 months ago, one is of another side. For Irish Republicans, those of us, Republicans struggle and for justice. My guess here would be that this is all one phoneme, uh, a low back or a lowish back vowel that becomes more rounded and maybe a bit higher in terms of tongue position when there's a nasal consonant like n after it. There's only so much that I can do without making this video nine hours long, so I'm now going to move on to a Derry accent. Um, this is not to say that I've said everything about uh, this, this particular person's Belfast accent. I've said nowhere near everything about it. But, uh, yeah, as I say, I want this video to be a watchable length. A lot of them were, I wouldn't say based on, but like I, I like to say inspired by. Some of them like very much so, like the grandfathers, my grandfather basically. Some of the differences here are probably because Lisa McGee is obviously a lot younger than Jerry Adams, um, and so there will have been phonological innovations in the time between their births. The first thing that I noticed when I watched through this entire clip, although I don't think it appears in the bit that I've shown you, is that Lisa McGee often has a centering diphthong for her dress vowel, something like dress. This is similar in quality, although I think a bit lower than Jerry Adams' ear vowel in fierce. Is it possible that Lisa McGee has these two merged, or does she treat the face vowel differently, or does she uh, have it a bit higher? I think, I think there's probably a height distinction, but let's look at that now. Uh, and when I say height distinction, I mean tongue height. I wouldn't say based on my grandfather, basically, a feminist that doesn't know he was one, doesn't have much time for men, find what made the best. And then pilot episode in the right place to leave them. In this small sample of words, I can see a difference between what would be the face vowel in my accent and what would be the dress vowel in my accent. And that is that the face vowel almost always, well, always in this sample has a, a really quite high mid monophthongal quality, like a. Eh. So the tongue is not absolutely at the highest point it could be, but relatively high in the mouth, and it doesn't move while the vowel is being pronounced. E, e. Whereas uh, with what would be the dress vowel in my accent, there is either a beginning quality which is much lower in terms of tongue position, something like e, eh, or it's diphthongal, it glides from one position to another, or both. Um, in particular, you can see in the word men, there's this very interesting um, I'm not going to be able to do it very well, but man, man, sorry if I've butchered that horribly, but this, this, this almost triphthong, um, I, I, I don't believe in triphthongs on a phonological level, but this, this thing that, which seems to have three target vowel qualities, um, and yeah, I think, 
I think there is a systematic difference between the dress vowel and the, the face vowel here. I, I like to say inspired by my grandfather, tough guy, combined. I took a year to write the pilot. There's a bit of nasalization on some of these vowels, um, by which I mean it seems like she's lowered her soft palate to let some of the air escape through her nose as well as her mouth. And this can be a contrastive feature of some languages, meaning that whether a vowel is nasal or not can change the meaning of a word. Um, that's not true in any dialect of English that I'm aware of, although there's probably some exception. So I'm going to assume that that's probably not the case here, um, although there's a remote possibility I might be wrong. Um, there is quite a big range of starting qualities here. It ranges from e eh to something like a ah to something like a. Ah. Now, this seems to be something that's allophonically conditioned again, something that's based on the environment that the sound is in. So after labial consonants like p, b, m, um, you tend to have uh, qualities on the lower end of the tongue height spectrum. So, you know, the only cases where we see a, ah, something like i, uh, you see i in situations where the vowel comes straight after b or m. So I think this is just an environmentally conditioned thing, and I think that this price vowel is all one phoneme. And actually, now that, I, now that I've noticed that pattern, that might actually be true in Jerry Adams's case as well, because he has quite a few realizations of this vowel himself. I'm very proud, and I worry about them. I think there's an interesting parallel here with German, um, in the same way that um, Southeastern British English has ow, as its mouth vowel, and then Irish English or Northern Irish English has something like oi. I think you know, this reflects the fact that in German you have um, un umlauted al and umlauted oi in the same uh, inflectional paradigms. For example, non i umlauted haus versus i umlauted heuser. The short vowels, um, and I've not included the put vowel here because I think that may be the same as the goose vowel, we'll explore that maybe a bit later. But the short vowels are pretty similar between the two, uh, the two speakers' accents here. Um, I've used them again to represent Belfast and Derry, but that might not be completely appropriate because the age difference is, you know, possibly factoring in. But the trap vowel in both cases is a fairly low central vowel by default, it seems. Uh, Jerry Adams' trap vowel seems to be a bit further back. Uh, Lisa McGee seems to at least sometimes be a bit further forward, so the difference between a uh, and a. Uh. The dress vowel in Jerry Adams' recording is more monophthongal, something like e, eh, which varies in height depending on the sounds around it. In Lisa McGee's accent, it tends to be something like e. Eh. Now, I've heard recordings of Jerry Adams from more recently where he does this centering diphthong uh, pretty similarly to how Lisa McGee does it, so um, I would suggest that, that that's probably just a matter of Maybe maybe there's just a random distribution where sometimes it's air and sometimes it's something like air in Belfast. The kit vowel seems to be pretty similar in both accents. There may be some systematic differences I've not noticed, but it seems to be e, some some kind of relatively high, relatively front vowel that's unrounded but a lot laxer than mine in, in a lot of cases. The lot vowel in both is a low back unrounded vowel, R. Um, the strut vowel in both is, it seems to vary between a low back unrounded and a low back rounded one, something like R. I think that I will need to do a bit more diving into some of these vowels to unpick uh, which words fall into which categories. But I think the, the diphthongs are where a lot of the differences appear. I think the price vowel seems to have a fairly similar uh, range for both speakers, so ranging from something like I to something like A. The face vowel, uh, pretty robustly for Jerry Adams, tends to be a centering diphthong, ear, and it tends to be a monophthong, ear, for Lisa McGee. The fleece vowel, I would suggest, has a, um, it's kind of a wider diphthong in Jerry Adams's accent. In other words, the starting point and the ending point of the, the tongue are further apart for Jerry Adams than they are for Lisa McGee. So for Jerry Adams, I would suggest maybe something like fleece, and for Lisa McGee, maybe something more like fleece. The goat vowel for Jerry Adams ranges from a monophthong or 
to a diphthong o. Depending on where it is in the word, broadly it seems like o is more likely to be used when it's at the end of a word. For Lisa McGee, I hear o more across the board, although there might be instances where, we, where she would say o as a monophthong. The goose fowl um, for both speakers can be a monophthong u, especially when it's in the middle of a word. Now, I was thinking that this might be the same as the put vowel, um, but oh, I don't know. Um, I, I think that this is something I'm going to have to delve into. Um, I'm not sure the put vowel is actually merged with, the, merged with the goose vowel. But anyway, for both speakers it can be monophthongal, but it can also be a diphthong. And in Jerry Adams's accent, I think this diphthong is more like boo, goose. And in Lisa McGee's accent, I think it's more like oo, goose. Apologies to either speaker if I've offended them by massively butchering their, their accent. Um, the mouth vowel, I think, for Jerry Adams, um, the, the first element tends to be more central and unrounded, so something like I, almost how uh, an RP speaker would say the price vowel, mouth. And for Lisa McGee, I think this first element is more backed and more rounded. Oi, moith. Um, I didn't get the choice vowel for either of them, so if I, if I notice that, then I'll add it in. Who wears in a democratic resolution? They sued, they put it up, has refused to do. There aren't really any good examples of the, uh, what, what would be my put vowel in this clip. Um, I would suggest that there was no real difference in quality, maybe a slight difference in length, but given there's literally a sample of one, this is useless pretty much. You know, sort of pushed this way, or I, it, I took a year to write the pilot. The pilot episode took the longest to write. When Granda Joe puts his hand on Jerry's ear and kind of loosely based on me, quite sort of wristless and, um, and maybe like runs a bookies on the side or something like that. Now, there's a a range of qualities here that covers what in my accent would be both of these vowels. Um, I don't think that she makes any consistent length difference. I would suggest that these are probably the same vowel phonemically, but I am definitely not 100% certain of that at all. So if anyone in the audience is Northern Irish, um, does coot the, the name of the bird rhyme with put? Um, although even, even then, many, many people, especially Welsh people, would say ruthless instead of ruthless, would say tooth instead of tooth. Um, so the distribution of these words is pretty complicated anyway. I did uh, a video on the um, put cut split or the foot strut split. Um, if you want to know about the, the sort of intricate weirdness of that in other dialects of English. But yeah, my, my guess would be that these are probably the same phoneme. And one other thing that I noticed that I, uh, I hadn't um, mentioned in the short vowel section is that there does seem to be uh, a, a vowel something like R. It was the united demand of the last 18 months. Very much so, like the grandfathers are one in the characters and like a top barrister. To me, the vowel in words like last actually does sound pretty much indistinguishable from the vowel in words like lot for both of them. Um, I think this must reflect uh, that these dialects have some version of the trap bath split, which I've made a, a, another video about again. And this is a 1600s split that seems to have happened in southeastern English, um, or I think it affects most dialects of southern English, um, some more subtly than others, where the vowels in trap and bath have become distinct from each other. So I think in this case, the bath vowel, which in my in my dialect is separate from the trap vowel and the lot vowel. In this case, I think that the, the bath vowel has probably merged with the lot vowel. So a test of this would be, does last rhyme with lost? And to me, it sounds like, uh, I, I don't know that Jerry Adams says lost anywhere in this clip, but it sounds like the way he says last may rhyme with the way that he would say uh, words in the lot lexical set. Um, if you're Northern Irish, maybe you can tell me whether last rhymes with lost for you. Another um, similar split, which I covered in the same video, uh, is the lot cloth split. And it does seem like at least Lisa McGee has this split 
uh, in some format, maybe maybe in a way comparable to how a New York speaker might have the split. And then it, it got much quicker. It had to go on, on TV at some point. It was greenlit off the back of that pilot. It took the longest to write. This is a kind of composite of features forming a London accent from the 1600s, around the time that Ireland was being colonised by the English. We have a lot of written evidence of how vowels were formed with the tongue and lips, which tells us about how a lot of them must have sounded, um, and I've covered this in some, in some other videos which I'll link in the description. I'm going to suggest an overall shape of how this might have progressed to Northern Irish vowel systems based on the very, very limited data I've looked at here. This is not a scholarly description based on literature, this is my Occam's razor explanation based on what I've seen here. Repeat, this is not an academic description, this is me seeing how far I can get with very limited data. My research here will not be nearly enough to learn the reality, I'm just, as I say, I'm seeing how close I can get to what the literature ends up saying. So as a baseline, we have these vowels. Kit, strict, bitter, lisp, better, hen, send, dress, put, bush, cut, strut, pot, lot, gone, lost, trap, last, arm, barrister, fleece, meat, meat, bean, face, pace, way, day, goose, loose, to, book, go, goat, stone, ghost, price, lace, bay, nate, oat, load, co, no. Evidence outlined by Mazarin suggests that the lot vowel had already lost its lip rounding in some London English accents by the late 1500s, so o became a. Part, lot, garn, last. The next step might have been the foot strut split, which happened early on in the southeast. This o vowel either lost its lip rounding or lowered, maybe lowered in the case of Northern Irish English, to something like a. In some accents, which became southeast and British English, the trap vowel then fronted to something like a ah, to avoid being too close to the new strut vowel. Trap. If the strut vowel kept lip rounding in some accents which became Northern Irish English, it was quite different from the trap vowel anyway, and so maybe it didn't cause this trap fronting which would explain why you still have a ah in Northern Ireland rather than a. Ah. By this point it seems as though all the long vowels and short vowels have different qualities from each other, so how long you held a vowel for had ceased to be an important way of telling the difference between words. So I'll get rid of this phonetic vowel length marker um, in, in all of the words where it is. This doesn't mean that people st didn't uh, still produce vowels of different lengths, but maybe that it, you know, it just wasn't as important and the distinction collapsed a bit in normal speech. Perhaps this contributed to the put vowel merging into the goose vowel, producing something like put, bush, goose, loose, to, book. The trap bath and lock cloth splits uh, got underway in London during the 1600s, which is the era of a lot of colonisation of Ireland by the English. And I, I would suggest that maybe the lock cloth split um, is the baseline here onto which the trap bath split is then layered because you have uh, some distinctions that seem to have been made by the lock cloth split which perhaps um, well I suppose unless the lock cloth split just happened along different phonetic lines uh, yeah maybe that's possible actually so what I'm gonna suggest is that um, in certain environments, maybe before certain nasals, the lot vowel um, became its own separate vowel category, um, breaking off into two phonemes. And then the trap bath split occurred, where before voiceless fricatives like f, s, and th, and before r, um, the trap vowel merged into the original lot vowel or, you know, the, the outcome of the lot cloth split that had stayed phonetically most similar to the original lot vowel. This is a, a complicated way of wording it that I think I'll probably notice some mistake uh, with in, uh, in, in the editing process, but it's, you know, it seems like it was a complicated sound change. This resulted in words like last, arm and barrister having uh, the lot vowel, but words like gone 
and maybe even lost having the um, the new or vowel. I don't think that this vowel sounds like it merged with the the strut vowel, but it's possible that it did, and my, my English ears are just not very good at um, making these distinctions. In terms of the sort of lexical sets, in terms of which words have the same vowel as which other words, I think we're pretty much there in terms of both of the accents I've analysed today, although of course either of those speakers could come up and say that I'm completely wrong, and they, you know, of course they have their own, they have infinitely better understanding of their own you know, lexical sets than I do. Um, but I, I would say that we're pretty much there based on the very limited data I've gone over. I think the only differences now are um, differences in the exact qualities of the vowels. And I think that's where most of the difference in the vowel system lies between these two accents. I think probably the, the most noticeable differences between these two accents from my perspective as a non-native um, you know, somebody who isn't a native Irish English speaker, um, are the consonant differences. So one big one is that uh, Lisa McGee's accent seems to have a lot more palatalization. So pronouncing consonants with um, a secondary articulation by the uh, hard palate. In layman's terms, this makes it sound almost like there's a y after the consonant, but in, in reality, they're being pronounced at the same time. So this is most obvious in words like character. The character, the gang. I don't think this is a fully palatal consonant because I think that would sound like character. Um, I think it's a velar consonant that's being palatalized, so character. Now, I believe that there's a pretty consistent difference between palatalized and non-palatalized consonants in the Irish language. So this might be what's called a substrate feature where um, during that period of colonization, when people whose first language was Irish were taught English, um, some aspects of their native Irish carried into the English, and then that bled through into the English dialects that, that formed afterwards. I'm mostly going to be using Raymond Hickey's description from 2004 because I think it uses IPA in the clearest way. Um, it seems like the, the palatalization of K and G is widely remarked on, and it seems like this happens before low vowels, which is what Lisa McGee does. Kya, gya. I didn't notice it as obviously in Jerry Adams' accent, but it is described as if it's a pan-Northern Irish thing, and it's pointed out that this palatalization is recorded from some registers of London English in the 1700s as well. Um, so this is there's something I'd read in passing before, I think, in Lass, um, Cambridge History of the English Language, probably. Um, I'd completely forgotten about it, and didn't make that connection at all, but it could just be from a certain lect of older Anglo-English rather than being a, a, a substrate feature of Irish. One thing I didn't pick up on is apparently the trap vowel is uh, sometimes e eh before velars like k and g and after k. So cap and bag are pronounced kep and bag for some speakers. I noticed that vowel length isn't phonemic um, that is, the length of vowels on its own doesn't normally make the difference between words. And a result of that is that some of the vowels that used to be long have short realizations, like beat and boot. And the kit vowel being more central than mine and having a wide range of realizations is widely commented on as well. This paper by Hickey details some recent changes in Derry English specifically. The a uh vowel in pull becoming pull in line with standard Northern Irish English the fairly high ear vowel in face becoming ear, face, and Lisa McGee has the conservative Derry pronunciation in that respect. Um, Hickey also says that the square nurse merger is spreading from Belfast westwards in 2004, especially among Protestants, so that where originally you had square and nurse, you now have square and nurse. This is analogous to a change that's common in Lancashire and Liverpool in England, uh, where the two vowels are merged either to square and nurse or square and nurse. Hickey provides some useful lexical set information of what categories the vowels fall into, what words rhyme with what. In this interest, he only describes rural northern, um, but given he's covering the whole of Ireland and Northern Ireland is relatively small, you can maybe forgive him for being a bit vague. Some important things he agrees pretty closely with me about the basic realizations of the vowels, 
Uh, we've already said that the kit foul is variable, so he's picked one of its possible realizations. I didn't personally use this E symbol anywhere in this video, but I certainly agree with it from what I've heard. Um, that sounds perfectly within the range of the, the realizations Jerry Adams was using. He has the lot vowel with lip rounding. I feel like I've heard both of these rounded and unrounded in recordings. Um, and clearly he's analysed a lot more data than me. He also has the strut vowel unrounded, um, again, analysed a lot more data than me. Rounding also exists on a spectrum, um, which is why I use some diacritics, some markers, for suggesting more rounded and less rounded. So it could be that these are just kind of in the space between very rounded and very unrounded, and different phoneticians transcribe things differently, but I don't want to make excuses. Um, it could just be that I'm not hearing it right, and he is. He has the foot and goose vowels as overlapping a lot in pronunciation, but with the goose vowels sometimes being longer. Um, this suggests to me that maybe he's also not completely sure about whether they're the same phoneme. Um, sometimes two phonemes can be kind of in the process of merging, so maybe that's what's happening here, or maybe he has a more robust idea about them being separate phonemes that I've, I've misinterpreted. Um, an example for me would be that the cure and force vowels are kind of beginning to collapse together in certain situations. Fleece he transcribes as a monothong, fleece, which is absolutely at odds with the recordings I've heard. Again, my data set is tiny, but I feel like the diphthong, a e, fleece, is much closer to what I've heard in these recordings. He records a trap bath split, a versus a. He has a distinction between the lot and bath vowels, which I suggested might be merged together. But as a non-native speaker, this might just be a distinction I'm not tuned into. He has the lot cloth split, like I suggested, where words like soft take a higher vowel than lot. He records the difference between the I and A realizations of the price vowel. Um, now he says that I is more likely before voiced consonants and A before voiceless ones. So pride and price. To me this sounds like an allophonic distinction and maybe not something a speaker would notice unless it was pointed out to them. Um, if you're a native speaker feel free to correct me but of course it is worth transcribing because you know from Jerry Adams's recording that I showed there is clear huge variation in in where the price vowel starts from in terms of tongue position. To try and find some way. His mouth vowel is a which sounds off to me. I'm very proud of. Um, the goat vowel, exactly the variants that I said, or and o. He says that the north and force vowels are two different phonemes here. North and force, which I wouldn't have noticed at all if it wasn't pointed out. Northern Irish English is a fascinating branch of the English family tree, um, and I hope that my fumbling through the vowel system has done it some justice here, although do let me know if I've made mistakes, because this is the kind of video where I expect to make a fair few. Um, thank you very much for watching. If you watched all the way through, I appreciate it very much. Um, sometimes I see history videos and I think they're the most absolutely boring things in the world, uh, and I realise this is probably guilty of, uh, of that, but yeah, you know, sometimes detail is fun. Thank you very much for watching, and I'll talk to you soon.